why they're so important? Well, basically, Bitcoin uh, can be described uh, as the currency of the people. I mean, for a start, let's distinguish between Bitcoin and all the other cryptocurrencies. So Bitcoin is the first one. It was um, given to the world by an anonymous uh, individual or group of individuals called um, Natoshi Sakamoto. Um, and it was put into uh, the, the cyber universe uh, exactly at the time of the big crash, right after the Lehman Brothers crash. So the timing was perfect, which makes us think that perhaps whoever Nakamoto is, is somebody from the system that knows very well how the system works. So what is really Bitcoin? Bitcoin is a currency which is produced by software. And this software performs all the tasks that a true currency should perform. So we're not talking about the US dollars, we're not talking about you know, the pound, or currency that constantly devalued because of inflation. But we're talking about you know, the old style currency that was linked to gold that any was produced and it was in circulation according to the rules of the gold standards which of course were very few for a very short time. So, so Bitcoin is produced by software. So it's not controlled by any central bank. It's not controlled by any governments. The, the software has been programmed in a way in which you know, these uh, Bitcoin are, are released in blocks by uh, an activity which is called mining. And this activity is solution of mathematical formulas. The solution of mathematical formulas becomes increasingly more and more difficult. Now, why is that? Because um, the, whoever created this currency wants to guarantee a scarcity. So there is a limited number of Bitcoin that will be produced, which is you know, 21 million. The time scale is going to be a century and a half almost. And the timing has to be every 10 minutes a block is produced. And the timing and all of this structure, right, is guaranteed by the difficulties of solving the mathematical formula. So the, so this is quite complex, complex system, which initially um, was, uh, was not really understood. Um, at the very, very beginning, uh, kids uh, used to, you know, solve the mathematical formula, you know, like with kids, that kind of stuff, and then use the Bitcoin uh, um, for various things. There's an interesting story of somebody that bought a pizza using, you know, Bitcoins, for example. But as we went uh, through the financial crisis, it became increasingly um, clear that Bitcoin was an alternative uh, to, you know, the fiat currencies, uh, which clearly after 2008 uh, had lost uh, you know, their meaning. Um, most of the bailout, for example, that was given to the banks uh, was produced by, you know, clicking uh, a few keys uh, on the uh, treasury computer. So in other words, money it doesn't exist. So th this is the issue that Bitcoin, you know, tries to address to create a currency that will give you that stability and trust and will not be controlled by anybody else. So the, the controlling system is all based upon the people that participate in the system. So you download your software, from a computer, which is, you know, of course, free for everybody. Um, you start investing, you become a member of the Bitcoin community, and you are the one, uh, together with all the others, that will evaluate uh, the various act activities that are taking place. So everything that happened is right there, is transparent, is in the clear. Uh, the solution, of the, even the mathematical solution of the formula, and this is very important, uh, 
um, once you know somebody managed to solve the formula and so a block is released, the entire community of people who are connected, so they're part of the Bitcoin community, has to approve that solution. So this is called proof of work. So it's quite complex to do it because you know we're talking about millions of people. Um, and this is why Ethereum, which is you know another cryptocurrency that came after Bitcoin, decided not to use the proof of work, but to use a limited amount of people that would you know actually evaluate if uh, that solution was right or not. But I disagree with that. I think you know if it's the currency of the people should be in control. The control should be among the people. So that's more or less. Is what? Oh, yeah. Then there is the other thing, which is about to happen, by the way, because in April, well, between the end of March to the beginning of May, there will be the halving. So every about four years, so every twenty-one thousand blocks, which are you know released, the the number of blocks, the number of bitcoins contained in the block is reduced in half. So at the very beginning, it was 50 Bitcoins. Today, we are at 6.75. And then in a few months, after the halving, we'll be at 3.75. So that is a mechanism in place in order to guarantee that the Bitcoin is not inflated and also to guarantee that you know, the Whoever is using the Bitcoin does not use it for speculation. How widely used is it? Well, at the moment, Bitcoin is widely used. Uh, we just got the approval for you know Bitcoin uh, by the EPA. So basically, every single you know big bank uh, um, is using Bitcoin for investment, uh, they're trading uh, the Bitcoins in, into the open. So this kind of recognition was very, very important. And now there was a reluctance, of course, to do that. But in the end, um, they, they had to accept that, that the popularity of the Bitcoin is, is a reality. So, you know, finance, uh, if they can make money for some, they, they will go and make the money. And there are money to be made, of course, in Bitcoin. But the, the, the key issue here is the fact that Bitcoin is a threat to the currencies in circulation in every single state. So the US dollars or, you know, um, the Bitcoin is a, a transnational currency, right? So it's a currency that you can use everywhere. Um, so, but it is a threat to the monopoly, to the monetary monopoly of the central bank. And that is why they try to stop it, but they couldn't stop it. They couldn't even uh, put it uh, out of law. They have done it with other currencies be before because the, the software, I mean, you can't put the software on trial, right? Uh, they don't know who Satoshi Nakamoto is, so they can't arrest them. And of course, you know the community of you know the Bitcoin holders uh, is the people, so you can't stop the people from doing it. At the end of the day, you know money is based on an act of faith. <laughs> you trust that the U.S. dollar is worth something. In fact, in the U.S. dollar, it says, in God we trust, meaning, you know, <laughs> it's a piece of paper. Let's talk about the, all the cryptocurrency fraud. Um, the queen of cryptocurrency from Bulgaria, you write about her in the book. Um, there's also, you know, a lot of people have been fleeced in this digital currency world. Okay, so at the very beginning, um, the... The Bitcoin, again, we're talking about Bitcoin. So Bitcoin was the first one. And then a few years later, we got, you know, other currencies. The one, one coin, the one I talk about, Bulgaria, clearly was a fraud and a scam. But so looking at Bitcoin, even Bitcoin was used for illegal activity. It was used in the Silk Road, for example, on, in the darknet. Now, why was that? 
because I mean it was a a, a minimal change. There was no control, and, and nobody knew really how traceable Bitcoin is. But once this became clear, because what I have not explained to you is that every single block which is released is then logged into a blockchain. So the moment in which the proof of work is approved, that block becomes part of a chain. Inside that block chain, we have all the information about the block. So who solved the formula, at what time, and so on and so forth. And every single time the Bitcoin contain, like let's call it block number five, okay? Every single time the, the Bitcoin contains in block number five are sold, purchased, have, you can sell half of it, for example, and keep that half. Everything is put in another block, which is attached to that block. So let's call it block 5a and it stays right there and you can't delete it you can't alter that's the blockchain technology which is behind the bitcoins so, so every single moment you can go into the software and see the life of every single bitcoin that was produced from you know day one in 2000 was in january 2009 so once this was understood, then the Bitcoin became one of the worst currency to use for illegal activity because, you know, you can trace it every single moment. Now, if you want to do money laundering, for example, of course, you will have to move the Bitcoin from you know, one of the blocks Let's say, you know, you have done some activities illegal and you have been paid in Bitcoins, right? So nobody has seen that uh, from the point of view of the, um, the authorities. But the moment in which you want to change that Bitcoin into a currency, right? Because, you know, you do need to money launder <laughs> those money. What are you going to do with the Bitcoin? Otherwise, it's not sits there that in that moment then that is going to be registered automatically into the block so this is how the the monetary authorities but also you know the um, anti-terrorism the uh, anti-drug squad have um, unveiled several of these activities used through Bitcoin and of course they have arrested people. So today actually, you know, Bitcoin is one of the least used currency because I mean most of the Ill illegal activity and criminal activity is actually done in cash because cash is still king when it comes down to traceability. Well let's talk about the fraud. I mean because these cryptocurrency empires uh have uh, pretty rapidly deflated. Well, the, you know, the FTX, I think is the best possible you know, example. But then again, you know, it's not the cryptocurrency per se. And again, I want to distinguish between Bitcoin and the other cryptocurrencies because, you know, I'm a great believer of, of Bitcoin, but I'm not a believer in the other cryptos because Bitcoin is the only one that has this kind of system that I explained to you. The others are much more loose. But in any case... I mean, the, the, the FTX story is um, is very significant because uh, how did it happen? Well, you, you know, some bank on fright was um, a trader. I mean, it was one of those you know, intelligent mathematical kids and he was trading. And then all of a sudden he discovered that there were discrepancies uh, in arbitrage between one place and another place. In other words, you know, if you bought Bitcoin in Tokyo, you actually got a better rate, right? Than you would if you bought um, Bitcoins in New York. Now, this is at the very beginning. So we're talking about, you know, seven or eight years ago. 
So he thought, well, great, you know, let's exploit these differences. Uh, and he made, you know, quite a lot of money. Then at that point, he decided that he was going to create an exchange. Basically, the exchange w- was doing what it was doing. So um, pr- um, prof- making money out of, you know, the the discrepancies in in prices due to the geographical p- position. But then he started to produce his own cryptocurrency, which of course was out of nowhere. I mean, it was not Bitcoin. It was that didn't have a software system. Just one day he decided, well, I'm going to issue this uh, currency and people start flocking and wanted to buy, especially celebrity. Now, the guy was very popular among celebrity. This is another thing uh, also of, you know, the this sort of tech titans is that, you know, they live in a ghetto, which is, you know, the super rich ghetto and everybody, you know, wants to make even more money, you know, using, you know, the expertise and knowledge of one another. So he started getting, you know, hundreds of millions from, you know, various people in order to invest in his own exchange. And, he, he took the money, of course, in dollars or, you know, other currencies. And in exchange, he gave them, uh, you know, cryptocurrency. So basically the participation um, at the exchange was based upon, you know, exchange <laughs> at the end of the day, you know, uh, dollars for, you know, his cryptocurrency. Now, why did they buy his cryptocurrency? Why did they do that? Well, because they thought that it was so br- smart and that the idea of the crypto exchange w- w- was so incredibly appealing that they thought, you know, I get today, you know, the cryptocurrency that is producing at an exchange of, let's say, one to one to the dollar. And then, you know, you you carry on making so much money, then his cryptocurrency is going to go up in value, right? And so it's going to be worth, you know, two to the dollar. And I'll be doubling immediately all my money. Okay. So it's a scam, but it is also a scam that was supported by people who participated into the scam, who were the victims of the scam, because, you know... (laughs) It's the classic uh, story, right? Of people that come to you and say, oh, if you give me this money, you know, I'm going to invest in that and you know, I'll double your money. Does the the d- does all of this threaten the hegemony of the dollar? Because, of course, the power of the dollar is that it is the world's reserve currency. And once it, it, it loses that hegemony, it is going to be catastrophic to the American financial system. Yeah, I think it's going to be catastrophic not only to the financial system, but it's going to be catastrophic also to the power of the state. I mean, yeah. So imagine, imagine a world, right, where you do not have any more currencies, but you only have Bitcoin or something similar to the Bitcoin. So um, a software, you know, will produce it, and then your know, people will control it. Uh, uh, so how is the state going to be able, right, to print uh, billions and billions of dollars to save uh, the financial sector from yet another, you know, crisis? That would be impossible because the state won't be in control of the Bitcoin, okay? But also, how would the state uh, print the money to finance the war in the Ukraine, because, of course, the state will not have control over the money supply. You know, money is key. Money supply is, you know, the pillar, the biggest pillar of power, of political power. And this is what the cyberpunk, you know, the, at the very beginning, you know, in the book, I start the book with the story of the cyberpunk, the group of uh, computer scientists in, in the Bay Area in the 1980s. And these people wanted to guarantee the protection of the individual inside the net. So to prevent the state from controlling the net and you know from spying on people on the net also. And they 
produce uh, a cryptographic system to guarantee the people would be able to talk to each other without being inspired by, by the study. But they couldn't possibly, I mean, produce a way in which people would not have to use banks to do transactions because there was the real barrier. You know, if you want to buy something, you got to buy it through a bank, through a credit card, and you have to pay through a currency, which is, of course, you know, controlled by state. And then came Satoshi Nakamoto, but he came 20 years later. So I think this is the real threat. Now, and that's explained also why the state is now uh, trying to produce uh, its own uh, uh, digital currency, okay, which is not a crypto, but you know it's considered like crypto. So, so they are trying to catch up. But I am a firm believer that this potentially, um, if bitcoins really take off, uh, this potentially could change uh, the structure of the nation state. Let's talk about crypto anarchy. Uh, and then uh, you mentioned Julian Assange, and I just want you to play out his opposition to the crypto anarchists. Well, so the crypto anarchists are so the the cyberpunks was a group of, of um, computer scientists, all from you know, the U.S. The only one that was not from the U.S. was Julian Assange. Now it was a very strange group of people because. I mean, they were connected through technology. So they were all, you know, very much pioneers in the computer science. But politically, they were very different. So, you know, there was a very strong group of libertarians, for example. I mean, the classic American libertarians, where, you know, the state should not have anything to do with me. I can look after myself, that kind of stuff. But there were also um, people... They, they were um, quite, um, I, I wouldn't say necessarily right-wing, but almost intellectually racist so, because these people were very smart, right? But also, I think the, some of these people have serious social uh, problem of interaction. A lot, uh, um, I, um, they were on the spectrum of Asperger. Anyway, so uh, part of this uh, group, uh, uh, was talking about a sort of supremacy of the smart guys uh, over, you know, the people. So they were considering the the people as a sort of inferior kind of groups that had to be ruled, they had to be directed, that they did not have uh, the same kind of understanding of what's right and what's wrong that they did. Now, Assange was very much against that. And so they had a mailing list, which was um, a mailing list where people would exchange. We're talking about still at the time in which there was CompuServe. So very before, you know. We had the internet as we have it today and, and the mail system. So, the, so they had this mail system where they could talk to each other and exchange ideas and proposals. And within this mailing list, uh, it was all cryptographic. So, you know, only them, they could see it. And th there was a, um, a very heated uh, exchange and discussion uh, between this group uh, of, you know, crypto um, anarchists, if you want to call them, and Assange, who instead said, you know, th this is an instrument uh, through which we can empower the people. The people should know. The people should be allowed to make decisions. And then Assange went on, of course, to create WikiLeaks, which did exactly that. And what did the rest do? Because they became, as you call them, the new robber barons. And you have examples in there. Uber is a good example. Uh, but they harnessed these this technology uh, to essentially carry out vast campaigns of pillage and greed against the rest of us. 
Well, I mean, we we have um, several examples. Now, in all fairness, uh, most of the robber barons were not uh, part of the cyberpunk mailing list necessarily. Um, although several of them, especially the founders, uh, uh, they became immensely rich because, you know, of course, they were in the industry at the very beginning. Uh, so they <clears throat> uh, they stopped working, uh, uh, taking away you know, several uh, um, several millions of dollars so they could do whatever they wanted. But I would say that uh, the robber barons uh, is um, very much the generation that comes right after people like Assange. In fact, you know, there are some of them, they are uh, younger, um, 10 years, not very much. But these are, are the one who came to this kind of business through video games. So forget about politics. See, now we have, you know, the very beginning, um, the internet was considered an instrument of um, empowering people and also um, bring about democracy into the society. Then, you know, a, a decade later, we have, you know, kids uh, who have grown up playing video games who actually know the, um, the, the functioning of the internet extremely well, and they spot certain kind of, of situations where you know, being in being computer savvy, knowing how to code, because that's the other thing, uh, could create a business model that could enrich them immensely. Um, and then they started. So the first wave made quite a lot of money, sold uh, their businesses, and then they became the so-called serial serial entrepreneurs. So what is a serial entrepreneur? So, well, this is a robber baron, basically, because, you know, they spotted uh, the, the, an opportunity. They learned from that opportunity. They made a lot of money from that opportunity. And then they decided to reproduce the model in another sector at the higher and higher and higher scale. Now, all of this was motivated by profit. So there's absolutely no... Um, desire to produce anything that can enrich society. I and mean, this is why I'm talking about the common good. Possibly this is due to the fact that these people grew up with video games. So for them, it's all a game. See what I mean? That there is this filter of uh, the internet, which doesn't really make them understand ex exactly what, what does it mean to be, you know, exploited or, you know, yeah, exploited, I would say, by, by the system. But possibly also because um, of their ego, because, you know, all of a sudden, uh, being a serial entrepreneur, being Jeff Bezos, for example, or being uh, Elon Musk or uh, Peter Teagle uh, was, you know, the maximum of, of the maximum that you could uh, could achieve. So everything was allowed to you because you were as that those original uh, you know members of the cyberpunk because you are smarter than the others. But they're not smarter. They're smarter no. in terms of technology. There's a wonderful no. short story by Stefan Schweig about the world chess champion and everybody thinks because he's the world chess champion he's wise. Uh, about everything else, and the, you know, the conceit of the story is that he's sort of an idiot about everything else. And I think you do a pretty good job of exposing, especially figures like Elon Musk, and you get into the whole space industry are kind of idiots. Uh, yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, and what they do know how to do is harness this new technology to exploit. Uh, uh, so just let's give some examples first. I want you to talk about blockchains, uh, and then I want you to give the example of Uber because it's kind of a classic example of how that technology is used as a bait at the beginning and then uh, a form of really a horrific oppression by the time it's cemented into place in terms of 
timing and exclusion and all that kind of stuff. But talk about blockchains and then just talk about the case of Uber. Well, I mean, okay, blockchain um, is is what you know we have in uh, in Bitcoin. So. so potentially, actually, blockchain could change completely the way we we interact uh, at uh, commercial level. Um, it also c- could make obsolete uh, a phenomenal amount of work. So, so now we're all talking about, you know, oh, yes, uh, uh, AI is going to make lots of people out of work, which is absolutely true. But mm, the blockchain comes before AI. So let's say, you know, you don't need any more to... Um, to have a lawyer if you have these contracts which are smart contracts uh whereby you know the, the contract states that if certain circumstances are verifying for example a divorce right then automatically the division of wealth is going to be such and this is signed and done so and that stays in the blockchain so can verify that it was done a certain date. Then, you know, the situation, you know, verifies and then here you are. You're, you're not going to court, you're not doing anything because, you know, you already have the agreement in place. Now, this is a, a very simple example. But, you know, blockchain also could be applied to smart cars. So here you are, you can have a driverless eventually. Uh, you can have a driverless car which uh, through, you know, a smart contract uh, will uh, go by itself, will drive itself for a change of oil after a certain number of miles and uh, go to the mechanic that will do the change of oil or maybe the robot they will do the change of oil and, uh, and pay automatically because in the smart contract, which is again in the blockchain, you will have, all of this information and when you know the certain number of miles will be uh, reached that, that verifies then you know all of this is going to happen so i mean that's that's what blockchain could do and the same thing is for voting now it can be positive it can be negative it all depends and this is the issue you know the issue is all of this technology can be immensely, immensely positive for us, provided it's put in the hands of the people for the common good. Well, of course, it's controlled by a limited number of individuals. So, and here we go to Uber, because, you know, at the end of the day, the concept of Uber, which, by the way, you know, the story is quite uh, uh, interesting because, you know, the guy... One of the two founders uh, of Uber is a Canadian, and he was um, he sold his first uh, startup uh, um, for you know, quite a lot of money, and then you know he moved to um, San Francisco, um, where he was working for the the company that actually bought his original startup, but he was doing nothing, right? So he uh, was going clubbing every night in San Francisco. Uh, and he was watching James Bond movies. So this is the kind of people we're talking about, okay? These are these kids, okay? So anyway, uh, while he was watching Casino, Casino Royale, he sees uh, um, that um, James Bond is calling his car with the smartphone through a map to come and you know, pick him up at... Um, and the casino. So at that point, he has this uh, idea to to create a system that would use uh, the smart the smartphone and the maps that Google had just you know put on the market in order to call a cab a night after going clubbing. Now, the problem was that you couldn't find cabs because there was a shortage of cabs in uh, San Francisco. So, yes, the idea to use um, rental cars, you know, the blue cars, the one that, you know, you, you can rent, uh, or what do we call in the UK, mini cabs, um, and put them on, uh, you know, a, a map 
and call and so that you know you could interact to in in the map and call them and see you know who is available blah blah blah. So this is how he got the idea, and then he eventually he did develop this um, the the first Uber app, but thanks to the technology. Now of course he knew the technology because you know he was um, somebody who understood technology, who had knowledge of technology. The uh the mini cab company in the UK that were doing that kind of service did not know the technology. So they couldn't do it. They couldn't do the, the, the app themselves. Uh, now, today, everybody has the app, but it, we're talking about a time in which, you know, really it was a, a great idea. And then, and then he had this idea that why using uh, these cars? Why not using normal cars? Why not using normal people? So people can make, you know, an extra buck, basically, you know, driving people around through the app. And initially, it was very appealing to the the drivers and to the passengers because it put together. I mean, so so it was a system where it put together two people that were happy, you know, to do business together. And the prices, the, the I mean, the. the, the the drivers were all self-employed, so they they got a good return for their work. But then, as the system developed, everything changed because of greed, of course. So Uber are taking more and more and more percentage out of the driver, and then it start conditioning the driver, also forcing the driver to accept certain rights well and punishing the driver if they don't i think you yeah in the book it's they have 15 minutes or something and if they yeah. don't accept then they can't even get work yeah exactly then you know if you do not if you do not accept uh i think it's three rides in a row you're locked out for 24 hours so for 24 hours so. but you see i mean i was uh, i was in calgary just now and um, I was picked up by Uber driver, and and this guy was telling me that he had lost his job. He, he was uh, from uh, um, I think it was from West Africa. He had family, a new baby, another child. The, the wife was not working. He had lost his job, and he, he was doing Uber driving just to integrate his, his salary. But now he was driving all the time. And you, it was telling me that the situation hasn't changed at all. I mean, Uber takes a big, big cut out of uh, every single ride. And I asked him, I said, well, why why don't you go and work for a, uh, a taxi company? And he said, there aren't taxi companies. See, that's the other thing. Because see, Uber has driven out of the market in certain places, not everywhere, in certain places, uh, all the competition. Now, that is another element of what I talk about the book. These people have been able to create an um, oligopolistic position for themselves and the few other people like them who actually can master technology, kicking out everybody else. Now, that is should not happen because this is, again, competition policy. But, you know, the only place where they're trying actually to stop them and to implement a competition law is the EU. In the U.S., uh, it's, you know, completely wild market. Well, they also skirt laws, they labor laws, regulations. Because they're a new technology, uh, there's no real oversight. Uh, and they exploit it. I, the, I, there's a lot in the book. I just want to close because you do at the end of the book with space X, space exploration and ecocide. Um, but here's where you really lay out how technologically these people are quite gifted. But in terms of understanding reality, the world around them, and of course, what we face in a moment of climate catastrophe, they're utterly clueless. Uh, and you 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 really make that point around this whole idea that we're all going to live on Mars or something. Uh, so oh, let's close. But let's, let's, of course, it's completely absurd. So, but let's talk about it because they don't think it's absurd. 
I mean, you, you actually write the physics of what being in a, uh, a situation with zero gravity does to your, it destroys your body. I mean, it's not even sustainable, but go ahead. I'll let you talk. Well, I mean, th this is what um, um, it took me a long time to write that section. I had to have, uh, you know, doctors uh, working for me to, to make you understand because, you know, okay, so Elon Musk and uh, Jeff Bezos uh, come uh, across as if they know it all, okay? Because, I mean, you think, you know, if these people become billionaires, of course, you know, there must be 